Hey, think fast. Hmm? Guess a number. What, like predict the roll? Well, yeah, it's like a random number. That's not a random number, it's totally classical. If you know how fast it's falling, and you know how fast it's spinning, and you know how bouncy the table is, everything about it, you can just calculate how it's going to land. It's gonna be a four. Okay, fine, you can predict it. What about this? Ah, geez, does that thing have a Geiger counter in it? That's impossible to predict. It's, like, random by definition. From that sort of aggressively terrible cold open, you've probably gathered that this machine generates random numbers, but it's not like rolling a die. It actually generates numbers that are completely and truly unpredictable based on radioactive decay and quantum physics. I'll get to analyzing randomness in a minute, but first I wanted to talk about this thing itself. Basically all it's doing is recording the time difference between high energy particles flying through it. It's measuring those high energy particles. This sounds kind of weird, because you don't imagine that there are high energy particles of radiation flying around all the time, but there actually are. There's loads of them going through your body right now, and you don't even notice, because it takes an awful lot of them to do any damage. In everyday life, background radiation has two main sources. First, there's radioactive decay of naturally occurring elements like uranium, which is in dirt and rock, sort of everywhere. Second, and in the process that I decided to feature on the box, we have cosmic ray muons. So muons are formed when high energy protons from space slam into atomic nuclei in our upper atmosphere, setting off a shower of subatomic particles called pions, which in turn decay into muons. The physics of how these muons actually reach Earth's surface is pretty fascinating in its own right, and depends on special relativity, which is pretty cool. But right now, all I care about is that they get here. About 10,000 of them per square meter per minute, and all traveling at nearly the speed of light. Yes, passing through your body right now. When those muons flying through the atmosphere come down and land, or not land, but pass through this vacuum tube, it actually generates a pulse, a signal that a circuit inside of this box can read. And this is called a Geiger-Muller tube, more specifically, uh, commonly known as a Geiger counter. You've probably heard of a Geiger counter as one of those like clicking boxes people would hold up to radioactive things in, you know, sci-fi movies and old nuclear test footage. This must be where the aliens landed. Inside a Geiger tube, you'll find a single wire held at a high positive voltage, the anode, surrounded by a hollow metal pipe that shorted to ground, the cathode. The tube, being grounded, has an abundance of extra electrons, and these electrons want to jump from the tube to the high voltage wire that doesn't have enough electrons, but they can't jump that gap because the gas in the tube isn't electrically conductive. Every electron in the gas is stuck to a positive atomic nucleus, so it basically can't go anywhere. However, when a muon barrels through here at relativistic speed, sometimes it slams into a molecule of gas and knocks off an electron. Once free, this electron rockets down towards the high voltage wire, in the process slamming into more gas molecules and freeing more electrons effectively making a small pocket of the gas electrically conductive for a brief moment. Basically, if a single muon passes through this tube, the tube throws a whole bunch of electrons into this central wire. And when that whole bunch of electrons hits the wire at the same time, it makes a spike in current that we can detect with the right circuitry. So how does this actually generate random numbers? Well, if I slow this down, you can see that in between ticks, it's basically just counting from zero to nine. And for those electronics fans out there, I'm running a 555 in a stable mode into a decade counter and running that into a whole bunch of high voltage transistors that drive the Nixie tube. For those non-electronics fans out there, it counts from zero to nine repeatedly. 
Now, whenever a muon flying down passes through this Geiger tube and it makes that little blip of extra current appear on the anode, the circuit in this box detects that blip and it says, stop counting right now. And that's when this number freezes on the randomly selected number. Because you don't know when the halt signal is going to come, the number selected by the circuit is truly random. It's like a magician riffling through an unshuffled deck of cards to select one, except the audience member yelling stop is a radioactive decay process. Now you might be looking at this still and saying, what's so special about it? You're counting and then you're stopping counting. What makes this any better than just rolling some dice? The answer is the use of atomic scale processes to stop that counter. As far as we can tell, particle decay is a completely random, unpredictable process <laughs> at the most basic of levels. You can observe absolutely everything that there is to observe about a pion and not be able to predict when that pion is going to spontaneously pop out of existence and decay into a muon. There's actually a more philosophical question buried in here about randomness versus unpredictability. Now, before quantum physics was a thing, Many scientists thought that we lived in a clockwork universe, where if you knew the precise position and momentum of every particle in existence, you could predict forwards or backwards in time everything that will or had already happened, because the whole universe was based on predictable classical laws that could be calculated. Of course, there's no way to actually do that, but the idea that cause and effect are like immutable properties of nature was a really satisfying idea. Unfortunately, then quantum physics came along and scientists observing atomic scale processes started to see randomness, things that they could not predict based on classical laws. And that left a question of, is it actually a random process? Or if we could somehow look closer and we could see inside of the particles, is there a little clockwork that's ticking down? There's a pie on there and it's got a little clock inside and it's going five, four, three, two, one, poof, and then you've got a muon. We don't know. All we know is that looking at that pion from the outside, it looks like a completely random process. And when I say you'd have to look inside of a pion to see a process like this occurring, I don't mean go build a better microscope so that we can see things that are smaller and look inside a pion. I mean, the laws of physics as we currently understand them prohibit us from observing such a clockwork process, if it exists. What makes this random number generator special is that it takes one specific subatomic process and amplifies it into a macroscopic effect that we can see. Now, if a muon were to fly through my hand right now, or if a muon were to fly through my hand like a tenth of a second later, it wouldn't change my life at all. But if a muon flies through that tube a tenth of a second later, I might say six seven instead of five. Instead of to say six. Maybe one of these times while I was testing, it popped up a four and then a two, and then I like ad-libbed a hitchhiker's guide joke or something like that. If you subscribe to the many worlds hypothesis of quantum mechanics, you could consider this device to be a universe bifurcator, where you're basically highlighting differences between distinct, decoherent realities. Of course, over here, nothing's been detected yet. We haven't gotten a single number, because every instant, the machine can either detect a particle and stop the clock, or not detect the particle and leave the clock running. And this is the haven't yet stopped the clock once reality. Every time it detects a particle, it magnifies a quantum scale inconsistency into something macroscopic that can affect our world. Ah, I got a three. Ah, I got a three, but at a slightly different time, which actually counts as different. Remember me, I'm still out here in the reality where no particles have been detected. Now, as time goes on, this reality gets more and more unlikely, as you can see by the fact that if you pick one of these on the screen at random, there's only one of me, and in every other reality, there's always been at least one particle detected. Now, not all of these realities have the same probability of existing, but this one, this one's pretty slim. Statistically speaking, the likelihood of ending up on any one of these timelines is not the same, but it's very similar, along with loads of them that I haven't shown because this is basically spitting out a new universe for every instant of time. The timelines that look special, like the one where no numbers showed up, or the one I didn't show that produced seven zeros in a row. 
aren't impossible. They're just really unlikely because if you pick one of these realities at random, you're probably not going to get one that looks special to a human brain. Keep in mind that the whole many worlds thing is totally hypothetical and it was just an excuse for me to do some fun video editing, but uh, it is an interesting way to think about all this. Although the Schrodinger's cat paradox has kind of been beat to death, this random number machine is performing a near identical function. The original statement of the Schrodinger's cat paradox posits a single particle of some long-lived isotope next to a detector. Remember that the decay time of single particles cannot be predicted. And if that single particle were to decay, then the detector would see that event and kill the cat. It's pretty morbid. Just like the Schrodinger's cat paradox, this random number generator amplifies individual, otherwise inconsequential, quantum scale events into things that affect the macroscopic world. Of course, the life of an animal probably affects the macroscopic world a lot more than displaying a different number on a screen, but still. Bizarre interpretations of quantum mechanics aside, how random is this machine? We need to define what random really means. Now, you could say that random means that there's an equal probability of displaying any digit. But if you think about that, if the machine just spat out 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, and then looped, it would have an equal chance of showing every single number. But it's not random because every number is really highly correlated with the number before it. It was just, you know, the number before it plus one. There's no chance involved. If you see the string, you can predict the next value. For true randomness, you should be able to see as many numbers as you want and still not be able to predict the next one in the chain. Because the fast counting clock always picks up where it left off, every time it detects a muon and displays a number, the next time the clock starts, it'll be starting on whatever number is currently displayed. If we set the counter to go slowly and set a radiation source next to the Geiger tube to make it tick faster, we can make the output of this machine extremely correlated. Most of the time, the random number is just one or two more than the previous number. If you were watching the output from the machine, it would be really easy for you to predict the next number in the sequence with much better than a one in 10 chance of getting it right. To make it the best random number generator, I would make it count numbers so fast you can't even see it. All the Nixie numbers would glow at once, effectively multiplexed, but for this project in its final form, I slowed it down because I like to be able to see the numbers cycling, and this is more of an art project than a useful real random number generator anyway. I didn't actually film the construction of this machine because it was mostly me sitting in Illustrator drawing corrugated edges, but the box was made of cheap 5mm plywood cut on an 80 watt laser and given the poly 400 grit poly treatment for a nice surface finish. The clock speed knob was actually turned on a lathe and this was my first excuse to ever knurl something on a lathe which was a lot of fun. There was also one 3D printed bracket that I designed to grip the Nixie tube from underneath and effectively gives a glass tube some mounting holes which is nice. The plate for mounting the electronics was actually made on the Hackerspace's new beast of a mill. It's like the size of a car, and I had it drill some small holes in 16th inch aluminum sheet. It feels like overkill, but you know, it's still a lot of fun. I soldered together most of the main electronics board years ago, but had to make a whole bunch of adjustments when I resuscitated this project over the summer. Notably, I replaced the free disposable camera flash high voltage power supplies with real high voltage power supplies that are adjustable and make a whole lot less high pitched noise. I also love the look of the Nixie tube as the primary display. This is the first project I've ever used a Nixie for and it's not a clock, sorry. I bought the Nixies in a clock kit though, they came with six. So it's a fun gadget with two high voltage power supplies and an excuse to bust out all the CNC tools and electronics is always as entertaining as it is frustrating. I hope you enjoyed this video about the physics and construction of this random number generator. And uh, if you wanna know more, I have another video coming soon. Maybe I'll post it the same time as this one where I actually look at the randomness of the pulses coming out of this Geiger tube and record the sound of a Geiger counter for a long time and do some stats. So if that's interesting to you, was to me, then uh, click through to that video as well. Regardless, thanks for watching and remember to subscribe for more projects and videos.